Uh, how does that happen? So then you have to figure out like, how do like I send back on all that stuff yeah. I was doing in mid October, and now it's just <laughs> an acceleration. Well, the offset is fun. Like I can find the offset of the chunk. I mean, the offset just keeps it. I can blame climate change for this, right? I mean, come on. Clearly, the offset of the chunks is easy. That's in the main index. I already have that. Like finding what the first where the first read is. Oh wait, stop. Or where my read is within that chunk. Or where does the end? Of, where's the end of the chunk? I'm just pleased uh, with this and have some words with the management. <laughs> so, if I do all of HGS, I can go for all of this and just do it myself. Major. And further expand the bioinformatic uh, world to develop the story with this platform. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's easy, but if you're developing a program that you expect non computer sound yeah, yeah, genetic workers to admit in names. Some of them may have Max and I'll be perfectly fine. Some are just I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> or their lab computers are well, definitely are good at lab computers. You can start working the exit ramps of the US twenty three. You take one side and take the other. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm gonna arc will blame you because of it. Now, I'm surprised they only get like forty bucks a day. Anymore. I was expecting more than that. I, I can tell you, you China can get forty dollars at least a day. Yeah. I, I it, there, there was a time when my friends got uh, stole by one of the thieves in the train it's station. Fun about it. And later on, I returned the modules. My friend said, "You guys are stealing." <laughs> 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 I'm trying not to make your heart hard, 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 like hard. Oh, really <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and take your things back. They're looking yes. at. Years ago, I heard no of kidding. Yeah, I heard people running Grand Central Station yeah, suits. Like they were too tight in a briefcase. They were doing high level backing. Probably. <laughs> 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 like upper <laughs> level. They have their own hierarchy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were getting $50 Jeez, from people on the promise that they were going to get their money back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, you guys have to pay membership fees. That's great. Uh, I asked Tony, so Tony's getting his PhD today. I said, you know, he doesn't know, he doesn't know what he's going to do. I said, we could join a hobo camp. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I've done that. Probably a bunch of nor have they oh, yeah. have the direction. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> and everybody just goes, whenever you go to any of the he just goes, I can't use my Sam on Windows. Show my talk phones I try to hold on. <laughs> Yeah, the dominance of the operating system. Uh, and everybody's working on clusters. So. Oh, yeah. Okay, I think I'm in trouble. <laughs> no, 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 no trouble here. No, 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 no. That, that's it is that's okay. blocked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing because of the defense this morning that I might have stolen some attendees. It's not the first time they've done a defense on the same day as Tools and Tech, and it has led to a lower crowd here. I don't know. Well, it's a set of these files. It's a little bigger than that. I don't know. Probably a couple more minutes. Two minutes. Yeah, I gotta go. Put it somewhere where everybody has access to it. Yeah, this is how we hear from people too. Some people can't get it. I. Some of you know there's a two here. That'd be great. Don't spread the word. Yeah. Hey. We're always recording. People can watch. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, by the way, where's the <laughs> on the off of the DCMB page? If you go to the events section, there's a tools and tech page. Okay, so it's a separate page now. Because yeah, yeah. uh, like yesterday when I tried to go through uh, yeah. all the presentations, so I see the presentation from this year. Yeah, I guess May 2016. It's exciting. So <laughs> they don't yeah, well, I, I see like all the old. Oh, uh, you might be on the NCIBI page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we have a DCMB page now. Oh, okay, now it's um, But we haven't yeah, migrated like, all the archives over the Like the yeah. last yeah. Okay. lecture of the yeah. yeah. But yeah, the newer ones are off the DCMB page. We should have a party. <laughs> yeah, we linked the NCIBI one, but we should migrate all that over.
So you want to turn your mic on? Uh, is it working? Uh, go ahead, say something. Hello. Okay. Circulated. Mm -hmm. All right, welcome everyone. Tools and Technology Seminar Series. I think most of you have been here before. Um, we have a few more talks um, this semester, and then of course we'll be starting up again next semester. So uh, most of you, I think, know today's speaker, but uh, our speaker is Hangju Zhang, who is a grad student in DCM and B um, in Wanfang Guan's lab. Hi there. Uh, I'll just uh, thanks for the introduction, and I'll just take over from here. Uh, today I'm going to present uh, one of our uh, RNA-seq quantification tools. And many of you might have questions saying, you know, there are so many quantification tools at the moment. We have TopHat, we have uh, RSAM, we have Callisto, all kind of tools. And, you know, what's the advantage of these new tools? And what's, what's the uh, new applications of these tools? And I will give a brief introduction of all these background information and show you some exciting applications on some of the our new data. <clears throat> so the major question we try to uh, solve here is to estimate the abundance of transcripts. So in human or most uh, eukaryotic uh, organism, we have this splicing mechanism, try to create a, uh, a, a variety of uh, uh, transcripts from the same gene. So in this case, we see a reference genome. We have multiple axons here. You can generate different kinds of isoforms or transcripts from the same gene sequence by skipping some of the axons or including some of the introns, which is intron intention. Or even do some like crazy thing like a generate circular RNAs, and uh, those are completely different types of uh, transcripts. Uh, one of the interesting parts of this whole mechanism is they can have different functions for different isoforms from the same genes. So if we can quantify the abundance of different isoforms from the same genes, we might have some clues about what functionality of this you know, cell types or specific tissues may carry, or maybe can be some kind of biomarkers for specific disease, specific phenotypes, uh, phenotypes and those can be very helpful for, you know, uh, biological research. We have all kinds of, you know, sequence technology. The major two for this kind of research are Illumina RNA-seq and PacBio IsoSeq. So for Illumina IsoSeq, uh, il sorry, Illumina RNA-seq, this is probably the most widely used sequencing technology. Uh, we do short resequencing, and we, but because it's short read, it's very hard for us to recover the original full length transcript. We have to do all kinds of inference to guess which isoform or which transcript this read comes from. And a great, a great, most analysis tool will greatly rely on uh, existing um, reference uh, transcriptome or annotations. And most, infer uh, most inference process will try to assign the reads back to the isoform by distributing proportionally and uh, maintain a like high likelihood function. Uh, this is not ideal. On the other hand, we have PacBio IsoSeq. Usually, we generate full length or you know almost the full length reads from the single transcript. But they are harder to quantify, especially for lowly ex lowly expressed isoform, because you can see one read or two reads or none instead of having a um, a, a real number there, like a one point something or zero point something. So uh, to quantify those lowly expressed isoforms is a challenge. And also, PacBio tends to have a higher sequencing errors here. So in order to correct all those uh, sequencing errors, most of the time we still have to rely on reference genome or reference trans uh, transcriptome. And in order to give a more robust quantification, uh, people nowadays try to combine uh, Illumina uh, RNA-seq and PacBio IsoSeq to say we get the full-length transcript, then we align short reads back to the full-length transcript. So there's a discrepancy between these two parts, and 
again, it is also an inference process you try to assign reads back. So uh, uh, how robust this kind of matrix are is still on the debate. So for us, we try to focus on the Illumina sequencing because it's the most widely used technology. We have two sets of uh, tools now they're available to most researchers. Uh, one set is alignment-based quantification. Uh, usually they have an aligner and a quantifier. So for aligner, we have so many different kind of sequence aligning tools like BWA, uh, top hat, bow tie, star. And they are designed, some of them are designed specific for, say, RNA seq or DNA seq usage. Some of them are more general, like just aligning. Uh, then we have quantifiers, like Cufflink is one of the, uh, sorry, I, I guess there's an S here. Cufflinks is the, uh, one of the earliest uh, isophone quantifier uh, that is being developed. Uh, GMAP is later on uh, widely used in PacBio isoC quantification. And RSAM is later on developed to uh, incorporate all kinds of biases and uh, um, uh, like sequencing error modeling together and build a very complicated uh, quantification model. Recent year, we have a new set of tools called alignment-free tools, or some of them called uh, pseudo-alignment-based tools. Um, we have Selfish, which is probably the pioneer uh, software in this, in this area. And then we have Callisto, developed by Leo Pachter, who developed the same tool, uh, Cuffling, and a, a series of RNA analysis tools. Uh, they are most of the time based on KMA. And Callisto and Thelma incorporated the De Bruyne uh, graph, try to uh, even um, op uh, further optimize the whole quantification process. So here we show a um, you know a, a typical workflow for like alignment-based analysis. We get the reads from uh, our cDNA fragment library, and we do the sequencing get different kind of reads and map it back to the reference genome. We get the fragments, which are most of the time axons. And then we gather all this alignment and do an assembly based on uh, either the, you know, the reads itself, or most of the time we will refer to a transcriptome, uh, a reference transcriptome. And then we calculate the overlap graph and do a log likelihood estimation on it. And basically, we will favor reads to shorter uh, isoforms that can cover all the, uh, all the junctions we observed in the sample. And that's the whole idea of doing this uh, quantification, sorry, uh, likelihood-based quantification. And it's still used nowadays, and the same in our tool. But this kind of approach usually are slow, because you have to do two steps, and aligning is not trivial. Read mapped to the multiple locations are posing a great trouble to this kind of approach, especially if you start with a, gene, a reference genome alignment first. And then you go back to infer all the isoforms. Usually you have to do uh, a fairly complicated process to infer like which isoform it is. And also, uh, as I said, there, recently there are a lot of new models that try to incorporate all kinds of bias together and make it really complicated. Then you have multiple parameters to tune and actually, we see in recent years when people trying to uh, do this benchmark, they tend to overfit that and make the you know, performance less reliable. And alignment-free tools, here we present the workflow of Selfish, mainly based on uh, KMAs that we observed from the sequencing reads. And it's a smart idea that is mainly restricted by the computer capacity back to the days in, say, 2000, early 2010. But nowadays, we have 64-bit computers everywhere. And you can do this kind of analysis on your laptop. So it's making things a lot easier. And to observe the KMA, to, to collect all the KMAs from your sequencing reads <coughs> and align them or actually uh, map them back to your KMA index generated from the reference transcriptome make the whole things more straightforward. And basically, now you can just count how many KMAs I found in my uh, sample. Now I can give an estimation of like uh, abundance of different isoforms and abundance of different junction reads. Uh, 
and do all kind of like a crazy analysis without actually doing the alignment. It's much faster, right. and usually the alignment based will take days to do you know analysis on a large bulk RNA seq data, where this one can do it finishing say thirty minutes, or even you know at at best one hour I would say. Sorry, at, at longest. So, uh, but on the other hand, because it's a heuristics, instead of doing alignment, we do exact matching of all the k-mas. So we're likely to lose some of the information, say if there's an indel or is a mutation, or if there is a sequencing error, uh, this program will fail to capture that and they have to do some compromise here. Um, and later on we will show that this compromise can be devastating for some of the cases. Uh, so we have these many tools, but we still haven't solved this problem yet. There's a lot of challenge. First of all, it's in, it is intrinsic to all the short resequencing technologies. Like we cannot get the full length of the transcript. We still have to do all the inference. We don't expect this can be solved by algorithm alone. And uh, the best we can do is to make our inference process as efficient as it can be and as accurate as, as it can be. The other thing that we often overlooked is the lowly expressed genes or isoforms where the quantification itself can be unreliable in certain cases. And we don't have a way to say, uh, here we can draw a cutoff here um, for like, you know, uh, the sample. Because like previously people used like one FPKM, five FPKM is more empirical. We don't have any analysis on this part. And well, we have, but not to a level that can convince us to have like a well-established standard. The other thing is ranking. So uh, recent years when people started doing this benchmark on RNA-C quantification tools, uh, they started to adopt SPM and correlation coefficient, which focus on ranking. And we noticed that it can be a problem. So here I show an example. When we try to compare the ranking of different isoforms from star awesome's quantification against the simulated truth. Uh, so here this, you see a, a solid dot here, which is uh, they are not expressed. And successfully, uh, RSAM report they are not expressed. And we see a lot of the dots here and a lot of dots here corresponds to the isoforms where one, either they are expressed but we report it or not, or the other way around. So you can see the correlation is not as good as we expected from you know, our common sense. Say if you have like a 0 0.99 correlation coefficient between your quantification tool and the truth, uh, they must be doing very well. And actually, no, because uh, for lowly expressed genes, especially for the one that are expressed or not, this kind of question are hard to answer, and we have problem just to just to define, uh, just to decide which isoform are expressed, which isoform are not. And a similar pattern we can observe from the gene level quantification. There are genes belong to the same gene family where the sequences are too similar. It's hard to tell. We can't really you know, solve that question from the short uh, reads quantification, uh, short reads sequencing technology. So earlier this year, in uh, January 2017, Dream Challenge launched a new competition called SMC RNA, Somatic, uh, Somatic Mutation Calling RNA Challenge. The idea is to benchmark all existing tools, all ask users, to, uh, or participants to develop new tools to do the quantification, <coughs> and they want to see which one have the most accurate quantification. And this is important, you know, especially, on, uh, especially in terms of whether you can tell whether isoform is expressed or not, and we can't even solve that very clearly. Uh, which isoform is expressed out of all these different isoforms from the same genes. And there are lowly expressed isoform how accurately you can quantify them. And also the expression level correlation in a global, you know, in a, in a, in a global overview of your quantification. So I will go through a <coughs> submission called Sigma. Uh, as you can see, it's a, uh, you know, a, a, a trick we play on the, uh, on the words, the seek k -mas. So all tools also based on KMA alignment, but slightly different from previous tools. Uh, we'll talk about it, its development. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a uh, terminal here, so I can't really do all the demonstration here. I have to skip it. But I can tell you basically it's modeled. Uh, for the whole in, uh, command line interface is modeled similar 
in a similar way as um, um, Selfish or uh, Callisto, basically you do an index and then do the quantification, and it's very straightforward. You're passing the fast queue files, and that's it. Uh, we will show you the development pr uh, process and uh, some of the exciting findings we get during the comparison and the benchmark. Uh, we'll show you the evaluation of our tools against the simulated data and the real world reference samples. And there are some most recent developments we you know, uh, applied on uh, these tools on uh, single cell sequencing data and show some exciting results. So for development, uh, you know, I, I myself is a uh, more of a programmer rather than actual, uh, you know, doing all the sequencing stuff in the lab. Although when I say programmer, my PI might laugh at that, but I would still call that. And for me, it's a new new question to, for me to tackle with. Uh, it's I haven't done any sequencing uh, stuff before, so when I get the data, it's more like a string comparison. And I will show you in later on when we develop those algorithms. Uh, the string comparison can helpful can be helpful in the whole process, and for this challenge, we were given a lot of training data simulated by RSM simulator, but the actual validation data they provide are real world spiking data. So that means there's a gap between the training data and the testing data, and one thing we have to take into consideration is the simulated data are much cleaner. And they have less, uh, you know. They, also, they might carry some artifact, where real world data are obviously real data, and we have to fit against the real data rather than the simulator one. So our tools are written in C++, uh, using Qt Core to, uh, you know, uh, uh, make the uh, stream process a lot easier. And we use Eigen to accelerate the matrix calculation part. So uh, later on, I will show the. Uh, uh, runtime is uh, practical for most uh, web lab uh, application, and it's comparable to uh, Sigma, uh, sorry, Callisto and Salmon. Uh, but at the same time, uh, our performance is better. Uh, currently, I'm working on porting it back to Python and Cyton, uh, make it easier for uh, third uh, third party extension to build in. And actually, we have a extension project going on right now to use the same framework, but to detect the novel junctions and novel fusions in the gene and the transcripts. So there were various observations we found, uh, we, you know, we found in the challenge. Uh, first of all, uh, we have this conflict between super complicated likelihood models like RSM, like GMAP, where they try to incorporate all kinds of sequencing bias together, versus like Clisto, they tend to stick on simplistic model. We just use the most simple, sorry, the most reduced model that carry the least amount of uh, parameters to uh, estimate the quantification. And later on, we noticed that reducing the hyperparameters in your model actually helps to improve your performance, rather than trying to incorporate those biases. Because it's hard to model all those biases. <laughs> and the time we're modeling it wrong. And it's surprisingly, you know, for all those complicated models, when they actually deliver the final software, they will disable all those uh, complicated parts by default. So you know that when you when biologists act, actually use all those tools, they don't use that part. The other part is focusing only on the hard reads. So uh, one of the challenge in this uh, competition is we really want to accelerate the whole testing process a lot, lot faster, and um, we really want to reduce the runtime to like within hours, and we don't want to waste the time on aligning all those reads that are apparently the same as the transcripts, uh, transcript talk. So instead of doing the full time alignment, we only focus on the reads that have junctions or have mutations, have mutations <coughs> at a certain uh, uncomfortable regions or positions. Those are the focus of our tools. And th this is the trick that Callisto and Salmon and our tools that adopt to reduce the runtime in compared to alignment based <coughs> tools. So we take the base framework from Callisto, and is I have to give credit to this marvelous work that uh, they adopted the Bruin graph uh, to re reduce the runtime. Uh, the basic idea is we have observed all those k-mers. Here a circle represents the k-mers uh, observed from your sequencing reads. Instead of going through all the k-mers, we can say, okay, in your transcriptome 
a reference transcriptome, you observe all these three k-mas come from the same set of the isoforms. So when we align this one, we don't really have to see the rest of the two. I know them. Now I just skip to the next interesting one, which happens to be the first k-ma after the branch. And then we can say, OK, this k-ma corresponds to these two, not this one isoform. So we can safely rule this one out in the alignment process. And by skipping all those k-mas, we recently reduce our alignment times. And actually, Callisto is so far um, doing pretty well in short time alignment, even better than Stelman, which is published a lot later. And uh, uh, they can, this tool can finish everything in like 10 minutes or 15 minutes, depends on the size of your library. And the De Bruyne graph is built during the index process. And it's very, I won't say trivial, but it's easy to implement because you know people have been using the Bruyne graph in uh, sequence assembly for a long time. But for our case, as we said, the reads can be dirty. It might carry, they might carry indels, they might carry a sequencing error. So what happens if you have something wrong here or wrong here? Then you lose the trick. Then you lose the k-man information. So for our tools, we actually do an alignment here if we find something here. And later on, we'll show the single trick can greatly improve the performance. And the alignment we use, the alignment algorithm we use here, we don't use traditional uh, Niedermann Woods or uh, Niedermann Woods or Smith Waterman alignment, which is uh, quadratic. We use a, uh, a pseudo linear scanning. Uh, this algorithm called, algorithm called a SIFT from uh, MySQL when they do the string comparison. And this is based on my experience in string comparison programming back to the days. And we find it very helpful in this case, greatly reduce the time you waste on you know, just aligning. Most of the time, 90% identity. You know, uh, when we have reads of 90% and identity, you don't have to do the Niedermann wound alignment. As for quantification, as I said, most program, actually all the program nowadays are still using this uh, likelihood function or its variants. And this likelihood function is proposed by Leo Pachter back to days when he pr uh, developed the uh, cough links. So um, people are still using that, and it's working pretty well. Um, and to estimate the likelihood for this one, basically equivalent to determine the weights for a mixture model. So we simply use expectation maximization for this. I'm writing some new optimizers for this because it's a little bit slow in converging. And as I said, one important factors when we uh, one of the important factors when we develop this tool is to reduce the parameter, get rid of most useless parameter like the bias factors and the GC content sum uh, ratios because we find they are not helpful and easily leads to overfitting, and the base corrections are not enabled at all by most of the tools, meaning we are still not confident to incorporate this kind of information in our tools. And actually, during the uh, challenge, when we try to uh, compare our tools against our competitors, uh, we face competitors from their practice lab, and they did very well in the simulated data benchmark. But later on, when they adopt the real-world data, uh, their ranks dropping immediately to the you know, nowhere. And, and why do they tolerate that? Why don't they change it, change their scheme? So in the first three rounds, they use simulated data, simulated data because they don't have real world data ready. And before the final submission, they did a real world data just to let us let us know how where how, how well our programs perform and where are we. And we are surprised by the result that there's a huge shift, and our program ranked at the top, and uh, Leo Pacta's uh, awesome workflow ranked in the middle. And one of the reasons we suspect is during the training process in the first few rounds, they actually overfit and tune the parameters, including all those bias and uh, uh, GC content things against the training data. And to make it worse, the training data are simulated using their own tools, RSAM simulator. So it's obviously, it's very easy. You can uh, you know, optimize the thing against your own tools. But does it really work on real world data? It's hard to tell. And eventually, the leaderboard proved that our, to, our approach to ignore all those uh, parameters are, correct, uh, are the correct way. Um, and another thing we make sure is that uh, the, uh, the final result is actually converged. So one of the challenges we had when we tried to adopt the Callisto 
program is they run a short expectation maximization, and the result is not actually converged. Um, so we will show some uh, simulated data. The, these are the uh, scores that we ob observed from uh, our training data. They are less ex uh, you know, exciting compared to later on when I showed real world data. But there are a few points I want to point out. So when you compare the Pearson correlation, everything is close to perfect. They're all close to zero. Oh, sorry, one. Zero bit imperfect. Um, but the most exciting part is the, uh, is the medium level expression. Uh, if you have genes that are not highly expressed, but they are expressed, say 1 FPKM or 10 FPKM, how well your program can perform against that? Because Pearson correlation can be easily dragged by the large number. And when they do the logarithm PS and try to downweight all those highly expressed genes, we may starting to sh it start to show there's a gap between uh, our estimation and the final performance. So here we are not comparing awesome here. So you see like some of the cases awesome are actually outperform us because uh, they, they, they use their simulators. It's fitting by themselves. But Sigma actually definitely uh, outperform Callisto in most of the cases. To make it even more Interesting, if you look at SPM correlation, which is comparing the rankings, our tools is basically always good. And this is small margin. But uh, to consider when you map the small margin of improvement to how many, how many genes or isoforms you correctly tell, they are not expressed or they are expressed. So here I'm comparing how many correct zero call we have in our program. So basically, if we found if we correctly find this isoform is not expressing the simulated truth, and we predict it the same way, uh, we, we count it. And the sigma actually correctly called the most number of zeros, while the total zero number calling compared, uh, between our tools and all the other tools are comparable. We are not increasing all the zero call here to drag this one uh, to, to, to really improve on this metric. As for the runtime, our tool is significantly uh, shorter compared to uh, star awesome. Although, actually, when we do the quantification, it's dragging a little bit. That's because um, uh, a bug in my program. <laughs> and I, I fixed it later. Uh, so the quantification is still slow in this case. But later on, when we show the real world data, uh, I can tell it's much, much shorter. And it's comparable to uh, Selma. It's still not as fast as Callisto, but by a few minutes. You won't tell. Um, so then we later on recently we did a real world reference sample uh, benchmark. So the uh, competition result is not out yet, and they probably won't release until uh, 2020. Um, <laughs> that's my expectation. But for this one, um, we got to do the benchmark ourselves against public reference samples. So we have human brain reference RNA and a universal human reference RNA that are widely used to benchmark different isoform or gene quantification tools. Actually, if you find there are a lot of paper using that, and most uh, tools paper, when they publish, they're using these two, uh, these, two, these two samples to do the benchmark. And then they do uh, QT, PCR, and RNA-seq samples. Uh, and they basically compare the result between these two metrics. Certainly, there might be some bias in QRT-PCR, but that's the best we can do. So here, I'm showing the sigma and the truth correlation. How many genes do they actually test with the RT-QPCR? They are genes. Yeah, but how, how many do they test? That, um, <laughs> so the problem with taking a sample like that is you, you <coughs> don't know the truth. Yeah. It's the sample. What do you use to define the truth? So uh, for this one, um, they have two, uh, like two like tissue samples. Uh, I would say biological replica. Uh, no, they're not replica. They're biological samples. Yeah. For each sample, they do QRT-PCR uh, QRT on 12,000 genes. Oh, OK. For each genes, they, can, they have. And that, do those discriminate isoforms? For some of the genes, they tell the difference between isoforms. For some of them, they focus on uh, genes with only single isoform. But they do have a lot of uh, uh, genes that uh, a lot of tests on like gene family, uh, which is a challenge for us. And I, is a nice sample. Yes, <laughs> and a nice thing about it is the uh, the cover the coverage on those uh, 
uh, genes that belong to the same gene family, which is technically similar uh, to isoform quantification from the same genes. They're equally challenging. And here I'm showing the correlation here, uh, which shows a lot uh, in terms of uh, uh, tells a lot in terms of like currently we're still having trouble in uh, finding the most accurate estimation of the of the abundance. So on the left hand, these are the log Pearson, which so the whole uh, estimation protocol we follow is um, uh, well established and being used by uh, BGI Beijing Genome Institute and uh, several uh, uh, other uh, tool paper to benchmark their tools against the others. So we will follow the tradition and do the log Pearson correlation estimation. So most of the existing tools they have, you can see, so first the three tools are pseudo alignment based tools. And the star awesome is the actual alignment tools. And we actually have a uh, top hat cufflink estimation, but that seems falling off compared to all these tools. And cufflink is uh, because of several technical reasons, like the uh, most highly abundance and most lowly abundance genes process, uh, they seem to be not comparable to our, all the rest of the tools here. Uh, and x axis is our prediction uh, log transformed. The y axis is the QRTPCR CT value. <laughs> So the CT value is, can be seen as a log transformed expression value, and you could actually label them that way. Yeah. <laughs> but the scale is not the same. Yes, the scale is not the same because QRT PCR when they reported they have a shift, so they have a constant uh, that is not normalized because different samples have a different way of mod. And actually, in this benchmark, the sigma prediction is done on five RNA seq samples and then average. Versus QRT PCR is down two samples because they use different technology and they are they use their own uh, standard processing process for different technology. So um, I think it's a fair comparison. Consider most of the time when we do RNA seq, we don't do one sample. We need three or four or five technical replica. But for the scale, yes, that this is like expected. So here you see like sigma differs quite a lot compared to the rest of alignment-based tools and link tools the star sam. And similar in another sample, we can see there's a uh, trend that sigma performs more similar to the alignment-based tools rather than the other, showing there's a gap in traditional alignment-based tools and the traditional alignment-free tools, but our program successfully bridged the gap in the performance. And in, the, in terms of runtime, sigma finished in 15, uh, 15 minutes, and Salmon finished in 30 minutes, Cristo, or as always, 20 minutes. But um, you know, it doesn't really bother for 20 more minutes, I guess. <laughs> and there's a recent application we get uh, uh, from the MIDAS single cell group that we apply our tools on single cell data. In this case, we use Fludan because it is the closest to the box sequencing. There are many single cell uh, analysis nowadays available. And they focus on the five prime or three prime when they use different uh, barcode. As for flu time, it's more like multiple box sequencing using different cells. And we can actually tell there are a differentially expressed uh, isoforms from the same genes in different cells when they carry different biomarkers. And the one nice thing about uh, isoform, uh, sorry, flu time sequencing technology is when you see the cell, you can actually take the image and you can see like the ground truth. So we actually collaborate with uh, Dr. Ibrahim Azizi and Max Weicher on uh, this project, and then they give a, a con affirmative response on how well our performance is compared to their label. So I would like to acknowledge my collaborators, uh, Dr. Uh, <coughs> Ramios and Yifan Wong from Dr. Ramios lab. So she uh, teamed up with me uh, to participate in the Dream Challenge and <coughs> developed all these tools. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Ibrahim Azizi and doc, uh, Dr. Max Weicher for their support in the post challenge analysis and the single cell tool, uh, single cell application, and the Midas uh, single cell group. Um, they give a great platform for us to extend the application of our tools. I would like to thank my thesis committee, Dr. Yunfan Guang and Dr. Margaret Bermeister, my co mentors. Uh, Dr. Gil Ehrman has been supporting this research quite a lot, and Dr. Jun Lee is been leading the Midas group 
uh, for this work. And Kevin Najarian and Stephen Park has been uh, giving a lot of suggestions in the algorithm development. So that's pretty much that I have for this tool. And uh, by the way, I just need to show you the tool is already uploaded to Git, GitHub. So it's public available. And if you actually, if you search Sigma in GitHub here, you can actually find the repository. And then we released the first version. Uh, oh. Because it's in C++ and I want to rewrite it a little bit. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I'm a humble guy. I don't like use one. <laughs> Unless it's really stable. Um, right now, you can download the tool and using uh, Qt and C++ and Eigen library. And you can uh, uh, compile it by yourself and do a like, uh, test if you have existing data and let us know. Uh, the, uh, there's instruction, uh, installation instruction in the readme page on the first page. And you can download the tools and get all the necessary library from Anaconda, which is very nice. Uh, um, hopefully, this is going to be helpful to, for you know, uh, bioinformatician analysis. That's it. Thanks a lot. Very good. So, what does the QT call for? Q, Q R T P C R quant quantitative. No, no, no. I mean, the, your your library. Oh, the Qt. Qt is a library that C plus plus library that is developed to ensure cross platform uh, development. So this tool, if I read in standard library, probably is going to be hard to deploy on Windows. So Qt make it a lot easier. Uh, in Anaconda, if you install Anaconda, you already have Qt installed. Is our theme of uh, sparse data directly applied to this project? Oh, wait. wait, wait. You know, the theme of our Midas Center yeah. is about sparse data. How yeah. do you mathematically and how do you model it? And how do you uh, adjust for sparse data? So, one interesting, that I actually, uh, one interesting point that I actually showed during the uh, uh, development section is that in the uh, in most samples, a lot of isoforms are not expressed at all. And to correctly identify the expressed isoform, or the other way around, to correctly identify the not expressed isoforms, this is a challenge. And those are zeros. So in this case, how to correctly specify the matrix is a, uh, I would say, computational effort in this challenge. And when we developed this algorithm, I, we spent a lot of time to, trying to optimize the uh, final quantification step make sure that we correctly zero out the isoforms that are not expressed. So when you have low-level expression, you probably don't have that many informative reads yeah. as far as isoforms go. Sure. So do you, so do you have any risk kind of... Risk unreliable and noisy yeah. reads. I'm sorry? Risk is if they are unreliable and noisy. Well, no, you don't. <clears throat> oh, it's just from the standpoint of sampling, if it's low level, and you don't sample things that discriminate well, or you only have like one counts of one or two. Yeah. So, do you put any kind of confidence information? This is something that I'm working on, and uh, I do have trouble develop this kind of confidence score. And what you just said is actually. More of a problem when we deal with uh, amplification-free sequencing and the single cell sequencing, where we have a lower number of a total yeah. reads. Because typically, when we say 10 fpkm, 5 fpkm, we intend to uh, we, we use that on bulk sequencing sample that has millions of reads or 100 millions of reads. Where in single cell sequencing, where you have a few thousands of reads or a few hundred thousands of reads, this standard should be adjusted accordingly. Because in that case, you have a 10 TPM expression level probably doesn't mean anything. So uh, you're right. Um, that's an ongoing project at this moment. Yeah. When you show how many uh, correct zero call you make, yeah. I guess probably an F measure, like F yeah, yeah, yeah. Would probably. I agree with you. Okay. So uh, and on the other hand, for um, uh, zero call itself uh, is not informative enough uh, to decide like which program uh, performs better. That's why we combine <coughs> the matrix in this case 
including Spearman correlation uh, and log Pearson correlation, to show that at different level of expression, our tools are still outperforming others. I think the combination of metrics gives more info, tells more of the story. All right. Oh. Yeah. Thanks a lot.